What's up, you guys? Welcome back to my channel. My name is Danielle Hallen, and I am back with another true crime video. And today, we're speaking about a case that is so tragic, but I feel like it could also bring a lot of families hope. It is the perfect example of why you should never give up on an unsolved case, no matter how long it has been sitting on the shelf. I feel like nowadays, I mainly see current cases all over the internet in the true crime world, and of course, those are important. Every case is important, but we can't can't forget the ones that nobody speaks about anymore, the ones that aren't top headlines or fresh news or easy to sensationalize, because those people still have families that are looking for them, that are looking for justice. I've just seen too many times when the media shifts its eyes to something new, how it affects these older cases and the families that are tied to them, how the tips slow down, the donations slow down, the support. And that is one of the largest reasons that I've tried so hard to bring so many cold and older cases to my channel, whether that's what's trending in the true crime world or not. And I figured this was the perfect case to bring you guys today because you'll be seeing this right before my birthday. And every year on my birthday, I like to ask you guys to put donations towards the Cold Case Foundation. It's a foundation that I donate to monthly. I have for years now. It means a lot to me. I have always just been drawn to cold cases and trying to fight hard for these families that just don't don't get nearly as much exposure anymore. And the Cold Case Foundation is absolutely crucial in helping these kinds of cases. They help to raise public awareness and they also create partnerships um, to help provide law enforcement with whatever resources they need in order to solve these cases all across the country. So it's definitely something that I support. And if you would like to give me a birthday present this year, please even a $1 donation to the Cold Case Foundation would mean the world. So today's video serves as a beacon of hope to families that have waited decades for answers. Justice can come, answers can come, and people still care. So today we are speaking about the 1999 disappearance of 34-year-old Kimberly Langwell, whose remains were just found a month ago, you guys, and just formally identified, I think a little over a week ago, 25 years after she vanished. So let's get into the details. There's not much media coverage out there on Kimberly. There's no huge Facebook page. There's not a lot of details about who she was to those in her life, but I will give you guys what I was able to find. Kimberly was a beautiful, smart, and gentle woman. She was born on February 24th, 1965, and she lived in Beaumont, Texas, which is a town just east of Houston for most of her adult life. On December 6th, 1983, when she was only 18 years old, her best friend in the world was born her daughter, Tiffany. Now, being a young and single mother, she knew that she had a tough path ahead of her, but Kimberly never believed that there was ever a challenge too big. With the love and support of her friends and her family, she lived an abundant and successful life. Now, raising a daughter on her own, she worked hard. She worked day shifts and night shifts and weekend jobs, doing all that she could to support her little family. She had a great group of friends. Some of them were people that she had known for most of her life. She had been in several different relationships over the years, but so far nothing had been very serious. Her world just mainly revolved around her daughter. Now, just before her disappearance, she had gotten out of a long-term relationship, but it doesn't seem that this really got her down. She was the kind of person who picked up and moved forward, always positive about the future. She was working at a local oil refinery at the time. This seemed to be a really good job for her, and that is where she ended up meeting her new boyfriend and her current boyfriend when she disappeared, a man named Ken Weatherford. And for the first time, Kimberly seemed pretty serious about this guy. According to friends, she'd even started to wear a faux engagement ring. They had just gone on a trip to Mexico together, and he had a good relationship with now 15-year-old Tiffany, Kimberly's daughter. But in late summer of 1999, everything that Kimberly had worked for was ripped away from her, and her family and friends lost one of the most important people in their lives, all because 
of jealousy. Friday, July 9th, 1999, Kimberly had been working at her job that day and got off around 5 p.m. At 5.15, she ended up calling her daughter Tiffany to let her know that they had plans that night. Ken would be coming over and the three of them were going to go out to dinner at around 6.30 p.m. But Kimberly told her daughter that she had to make a stop first. So six months prior, Kimberly had actually broken off a relationship with a man named Terry Rose. And according to Kimberly, she said she had to stop by his house for a little bit. She wouldn't be there long and would head home immediately afterward. By 6.30 p.m., Kimberly's new boyfriend Ken was waiting with her daughter Tiffany for Kimberly to show up at home so they could all go to dinner together and enjoy their Friday night. But minutes passed which turned into hours and Kimberly still wasn't home. They had both tried to reach out to her on her cell phone numerous times but she wasn't answering which was also unlike her. So according to Kimberly's sister she later went on to say that Tiffany decided to reach out to Terry Rose since that was the last place that she was supposed to go this ex-boyfriend's house. Now Terry allegedly told Tiffany that her mom had already left, but suddenly he kind of switched the tone of the conversation and the topic and he became angry. He didn't seem concerned that, you know, Tiffany was telling him Kimberly never showed up back at home. He didn't ask how he could help. Like there was no worry at all in what he was saying. Instead, he turned things around and demanded to know why he wasn't invited to dinner. It just seemed really, really strange what he was focused on at the time. Now, after this bizarre our phone call with Terry Rose, Ken and Tiffany decided to continue waiting for Kimberly, hoping that maybe she just had an emergency stop to make. She just hadn't called them to let them know. They truly believed there had to be an explanation as to why she hadn't shown up for dinner, and they believed that at any moment she would walk in the door. But by the time 10 p.m. came around, Ken decided that he needed to go out and look for her. This was so unlike Kimberly. So Tiffany stayed at home just just in case her mom came back and Ken went to do rounds in Beaumont. He checked all of the bars that Kimberly may stop at, you know, parking lots, small stores she might go to. And by 10.30 p.m., he found her silver 1994 Nissan Altima. Ken said that her car stuck out to him because it was one of the only cars left in the parking lot in this specific shopping center. Her car was parked right outside of an Eckerd's drugstore off of Dowlin and Phelan Road. So he he hopped out and took a look into the car, trying to see if maybe she was inside, if something happened to her, um, or if there were any clues as to where she may have gone, because this seemed like such a bizarre spot for her car to just be parked. But she wasn't in there. There didn't seem to be anything odd at all with the car itself. So he assumed that maybe she just decided to not go to dinner and instead was picked up by another friend. She made new plans and none of that really sounded like Kimberly, but no one ever wants to assume the worst in these kinds of scenarios. So he went home hoping that she would pop up the next day. Now by 8 a.m., Ken was back in that parking lot of Eckert's praying that her car was gone, that she came back to get it, that she was now safe at home. But when he pulled in, it was still there. So right away, Beaumont police were called to report Kimberly as missing. They had given the situation the benefit of the doubt long enough, and now they knew that something had to be wrong. Authorities went straight to that Eckerd's drugstore parking lot to take a look at her car and see if there were any signs there that could lead them to where she may have gone. But there were no signs of a struggle. There were really no clues at all in the car. The only things missing were Kimberly, her purse, and her keys. But strangely, her cell phone and a few other personal belongings Belongings, like her makeup bag were left behind. So they tried to figure out the most logical explanation to this so far, but it kept leading them back to something had to be wrong here. Kimberly hadn't mentioned needing to stop anywhere after Terry's, but they also had to consider the fact that she was an adult and plans can change. But even when they looked at it from that angle, it felt like that was pushing it. So this particular store was way out of the way. It was nowhere along her route to go home from Terry's. And so they didn't understand why she would have gone in that direction. They also checked surveillance at not just the Eckerd's, but other stores around it. And there's no sign of Kimberly ever going in any anywhere. She had no reason to be in the shopping center parking lot at all. Now, they also considered the possibility that she was picked up by someone just like Ken had originally thought, that she changed her plans, just failed to tell everyone, and went out with a friend. But nobody that knew her had seen her or spoken to her at all. And the last call that she made was to her daughter. 
There was no other sign that she had been in contact with anyone to make different plans. They also checked her bank cards and none of them had been used. Everyone who knew Kimberly personally knew that something would have had to happen to her against her will. As I said before, her life revolved around Tiffany, so there was no way that she would purposely run off or leave Tiffany behind. Someone would have to drag her away kicking and screaming. And according to friends and family, there unfortunately was more than one person that may have had it out for her. And so the first place that authorities wanted to look was at Terry. He was the last person that she was supposed to be with, and they had a rocky history, and that is honestly putting it really lightly. Friends and family of Kimberly had nothing at all good to say about Terry. Nobody liked him. He was described as being obsessive, possessive, and aggressive. Three absolutely terrible character traits. Some said that he had initially seemed like a good boyfriend when Kimberly first started dating him. He owned a record business and it was really successful, but their relationship went downhill really fast. Terry would call Kimberly when she was out with her friends and demand to know where she was. He was 21 questioning her. Who are you with? When will you be home? What is going on? And her friends heard all of these conversations. He wanted to be in control of every aspect of her life. And her daughter, Tiffany, agreed with this. She said that she had never liked Terry and her mom knew that. She spoke of times when he would be forceful with her to remind her that he was in control. It was a really toxic and dangerous relationship. And just before they broke things off six months prior to her disappearance, things had escalated even more. Kimberly had a really good family friend. Um, it was a woman and her daughter and she confided in and them that Terry had tried to strangle her to the point that she blacked out. She said that in those moments, she swore that she was about to die, like she was preparing for it mentally. But for some reason, he stopped and she came too. And it was at this point that she knew she had to leave him. She had tried to leave him already several times, but if you've ever been in any sort of abusive relationship, you know that it's not as simple as leaving. And I already know there's gonna be so many comments on this video like there are on every other video where everyone says, just leave, just leave, as if it's legitimately that simple. But Terry, as I said, would do all he could to stop her. He would physically block the door. He would threaten to kill her if she left him or ended up with another man. It was a really scary situation. And Terry was horrified for herself, for her daughter. Statistically, when someone tries to leave an abusive relationship, that is the most dangerous time in the entirety of that relationship. Kimberly was even scared enough that she told those close to her that if anything ever happened to her, she was buried in Terry's backyard, which tells me that was probably a threat that he had made to her before, because that is incredibly specific. She also told people that if she ever turned up dead and someone tried to say that she ended her own life, that was not at all the case. But ultimately, Kimberly was able to get out of the relationship. However, that didn't mean Terry accepted it and he didn't go away. Terry managed to keep control of her monetarily and mentally. Even though they technically weren't in a relationship anymore, he still made sure he was in charge of everything he possibly could be. While they were in a relationship, he had given her a cell phone, so that cell phone was tied to his plan, so he controlled that. He would jump in and pay for other bills without being asked uh, in order to stick around. He would also randomly give her cash and kind of use those things to hold it over her head and control her still, all pathetic attempts to stay in her life. And the whole time, he still continued to threaten her. Like from afar, he still had his claws and this poor woman. At this point, Kimberly didn't know what to do. She had like escaped one layer of this awful abuse, but was just stuck in yet another one. And according to those that knew her, it felt like she was just hoping that if she just stayed nice to him and kept him at arm's length and remained calm, that he would just eventually go away. So obviously, Terry is not looking like a really good guy right now and absolutely may have reasons to want to harm Kimberly. He had legitimately told her he would several times before. So they brought him in for questioning. 
Terry did confirm with authorities that their relationship had ended six months prior, and he also admitted that their relationship had not been great. He said that they got into several verbal arguments, and he even said that at one point it got physical, that he had slapped her across the face. But he told authorities he had nothing to do with Kimberly's disappearance. So they asked him what on earth she was doing over at his house that day, because obviously it's a little suspicious that she was over there and all of a sudden she is missing. So Terry told authorities that he had reached out to her that day to ask for a little help. He said that he was in the middle of renovating his home and he needed help putting up a few boards on the wall, but he needed to screw them in. Someone needed to hold them. And so she agreed to help out. And he said that she came over after she left work and she was only there for about 15 to 20 minutes before she left. And he claimed that after that, he never spoke to her or saw her again. Again, he told police that he stayed alone at his home after this until around 9.30 p.m. that night when he headed to a local pool hall called the Corner Pocket. So really, he didn't have a solid alibi. He was the last to see her, and then he had hours unaccounted for where he was by himself at home. And he definitely could have had a motive. Authorities decided to search his home and his record service because they were both on the same property. There were several buildings on the property, but they never found any sign of obvious foul play or Kimberly. They checked for blood. They did what they could, but there was just nothing. And Terry wasn't the only one in question here. Ken, Kimberly's current boyfriend, was also brought in simply because he was dating her at the time. Maybe he was mad that she decided to go and see an ex-boyfriend that day, but he was quickly ruled out. However, enter creep number two. Frank McCormick. Friends, family, and co-workers had a lot to say about this man. Now, Frank was Kimberly's supervisor, a married man, and he too, just like Terry, was obsessed with her. Now, Frank had apparently pursued Kimberly at work. He was flirting with her, and eventually he began to write her all out love letters. And we know this because all of them were saved. Kimberly seemed to know she was in a very tricky situation with her boss, and she was scared if at any point she didn't like comply with his wishes or reciprocate these feelings that she would end up fired because of it. So she knew she had to save these letters in case she needed to prove what he had been doing this entire time. So every time Frank gave her a letter, she would hand it over to one of her close friends for safekeeping. Also, this was a safe thing to do because now there's someone else other than her that knows that her married boss is just professing his love to her on a regular basis. Now, in these dozens and dozens and dozens of letters, Frank confesses his love for Kimberly. I'm talking just doting on her, telling her how much she means to him. Um, he offers to fly her and her daughter out to places like Europe. It was very intense, and it almost seemed like he was trying to convince her that she had feelings for him and just didn't realize it yet. Like, it didn't matter if she said nothing back, if she didn't reciprocate anything. Like, she had obviously kind of gently turned him down several times, and he would write to her about these times and basically just make it seem like she was just confused or kind of start to pity himself because she wasn't showing him the same attention that he was showing her. It also seemed like he was trying to manipulate her as well by playing on her empathy, her kind nature. He would say that he needed to be saved and only she could save him and that he had never felt so deeply for anyone before and he had to be with her. She was basically the answers to all of his prayers. He wrote about the fact that he drove past her house 20 to 30 times a week. So we're really talking obsession here. He even said that he had a whole file of letters that he had written to her and just never got the courage to give to her. So not only do we have all of these creepy one-sided letters, but there was also potential motive as well because Frank was married. He was high up in this business. He had a lot riding on this secret love with his subordinate. So maybe the fear of being found out 
could have been enough to make him want to harm her. Maybe she said, hey, if you don't stop doing this, I'm going to tell X, Y, Z. I'm going to show these letters to your wife. I saved all these letters. Or maybe he finally decided to act on his fantasies and he took her. She disappeared just after leaving work. So it could make sense. Maybe he followed her and things went bad. Or there was even another possibility. So there's so many different ways this could have gone. Ken Weatherford, her new boyfriend, also worked at the same company. They all knew each other. And according to Ken, Frank was not happy that the two were dating. Ken even said that at one point he left Kimberly's house and saw Frank sitting in his car on the other side of the road, just staring. He was jealous and angry, and that is a lot of potential motives floating around there. So we've got these two men who both are just absolutely obsessed with this missing woman, and both of them have like at least five different reasons they might want to get rid of her. Authorities brought Frank in to question him about what was going on, and it was suspicious because he really downplayed his one-sided relationship with Kimberly. He kept saying that he had like a maybe a small crush on her, but you know, it was nothing that serious. Um, he didn't at all mention his letters of love for her, even though he wrote probably hundreds of them. Honestly, um, he said that he had no reason to harm her. He wouldn't even pursue her romantically because he had so much going on in his life that it would ruin. So while that's definitely suspicious, unlike Terry, Frank was able to provide somewhat more of a solid alibi, but it still was not perfect. Frank showed authorities that he had a receipt from a grocery store that was timestamped to 6.56 p.m. the night that Kimberly disappeared. So we still have around two hours unaccounted for, but it was at least something. And maybe they also had something showing when he left work. I have no clue. It's not been mentioned. Um, but he said that he had stopped at the grocery store to get a few things to enjoy while he hosted a poker game later that night with eight of his friends. And so that was just kind of another layer onto him being somewhere else around the time she potentially had something happen to her. And all eight of his friends corroborated his story. So while it was still maybe a possibility because we have this two hour questionable time frame, at this point, it just didn't seem as likely that Frank was involved in whatever happened to Kimberly. At this point, searches for Kimberly continued. Her family was pushing for answers. The media tried to elicit tips and everything that was coming in just continued continue to point to Terry. Kimberly's sister actually went to Terry's house just after she went missing to inform him more formally of what was going on and that there was an actual investigation into this. And again, instead of sympathy and asking how to help, just like he acted in the phone call with Tiffany, he had a very awful response. He said something along the lines of good, now you know how I feel. Terry proceeded to say that he had given Kimberly $500 to go to Mexico with some of her girlfriends, and that instead he found out that she'd gone with another man, which we know was Ken, and apparently Terry found out about that as well, and he was mad about it. And when you go to someone, the last person potentially to see this missing person, and you're like, hey, they're missing, and his response is good, definitely not a good sign. And when you pair that with strange statements that he made to Tiffany about not being invited to dinner, it seemed he was way more concerned about the fact that Kimberly was with another man and he wasn't involved in her life anymore than the fact that nobody could find her. Even though they weren't together, he still felt so entitled to her time and it seems in his mind she belonged to him. He obviously found out about dinner at some point with this other man. Maybe he found out that she was going with Ken specifically and got mad. And on top of that, they had found out that Kimberly had been wearing a white t-shirt with Cozumel written on it from that Mexican Mexico trip, and maybe she was wearing that faux engagement ring that all of her friends remembered seeing on her. And if she showed up wearing all of those things indicating that she had moved on and kind of like were pressure points for a lot of his anger towards her at the time, any one of those things could have set Terry off. Some of Terry's co-workers even came forward to authorities and confirmed that they saw Kimberly's car at Terry's house, which we knew already that she went there, so that wasn't necessarily odd, um, but the timing did seem 
seem just a little bit strange. As I said, his home and his record service were on the same property, and one employee said that they pulled in and saw her car sitting there at around 5.50 p.m., but there was no sign of Kimberly herself. And by 6.20 p.m., 30 minutes later, her car was gone. And again, while this could fit the timeline of how long she stayed, there was really no way to confirm. But another witness came forward that expanded this timeline, and it linked Terry to her car in that Eckerd's parking lot. This person called in and said that they saw Terry's tow truck in the shopping center at 645 p.m. So Kimberly's car was possibly towed there by him. And even more suspiciously, that same pool hall that he claimed he went to around 930 that night was in the exact same shopping center. What are the chances but unfortunately, at this point, all authorities had against Terry was circumstantial evidence, and it just was not enough to bring forward any charges. They announced at this point that they did believe foul play was involved and that Kimberly was likely no longer alive, but they knew they would need a body or something huge to be able to move forward. Over the next few years, they continued fighting to find Kimberly. Her family also held on to hope that they would eventually have answers. All the while, Terry allegedly tormented them. Kimberly's sister used to have a website where she shared a lot of what was going on in regards to her sister's disappearance. And according to posts by Kimberly's sister, Terry bothered them for years after Kimberly went missing. Just after her disappearance, he personally called them and let them know that he was about to go and take a polygraph test, which is weird because it's like, why do we need to know about this directly? Like it was just something strange, but even stranger, he let them know that he knew he was going to fail, but didn't elaborate at all. It was almost like he wanted them to know he did something and, and there was going to be questions about it, but he enjoyed the fact that no one was going to be able to prove it. He then called them months into the investigation, asking if they had heard from Kim. Like, we're just like, hey, have you heard from her lately? As if she's not a missing person that is believed to be dead at this point. And suspiciously, right after he made this call, they started getting these ghost calls that went on for two years. Someone calling them regularly, saying nothing on the other end. And it wasn't until one of those phone calls was interrupted by like a police scanner in the background that they finally stopped. And her family strongly believed it was Terry making these phone calls. Because he had this record service, he likely had something like a police scanner in his shop. So they thought it was him just tormenting them even further. In 2002, three years after Kimberly disappeared, Terry even approached Tiffany in public asking questions about her mom. And they all had issues with this man. And so Kimberly's sister confronted him about it, said, hey, stay away from her. She wants nothing to do with you. And his response to this was not even, you know, an apology or anything along those lines. Instead, he said, hey, by the way, uh, do you want to know what polygraph question I ended up failing on that test that I took years ago? And then he proceeded to tell her that it was when he was asked if he killed Kimberly. Now, while she continued to push the case out into the public, Kimberly's brother also started to try to make sense of all of this. And he actually put together a database in regards to her disappearance, trying to find any sort of pattern or something that may lead to Kimberly. Tiffany eventually got married and moved away, and she was tired of everyone pitying her and asking her about her mom. So she started to just tell people that her mom had died years prior to avoid it all. And this is why victims' advocacy is so important Important, making sure that these families who are victims as well get the resources that they need, the therapy that they need, the help that they need because they are struggling. But after years and years, there just still seem to be nothing at all. And so eight years into Kimberly's disappearance, authorities decided to take a fresh look at the case. They were going and re-questioning those that they could, hoping that maybe they would get new information or this would bring them closer to an arrest, but nothing seemed to come from it. A woman named Dee Dee Keen, who had survived two abductions of her own and ran her own organization, also stepped in to try and help continue raising awareness. She would stand on the corner where Kimberly's car was found on the anniversary of her disappearance each year, passing out flyers and reminding people that she can't be forgotten. So many years passed and there was just nothing but a handful of people desperately still pushing for answers. And then this last April of 2024, 
Nicole Justice decided to air an episode on this case. There were several investigators in Beaumont that had not given up on finding Kimberly, but they knew they would need more. They knew they would need to push in order to get the rest of the answers they needed to hopefully bring her home and get some sort of arrest. And so together with Kelly Siegler, they went back and took another look at these potential suspects, Frank and Terry. Frank very willingly, these 25 years later, still came into the police department. He agreed to speak to them and tell them what he remembered, um, but he still was acting a little odd. I mean, he really continued to downplay what happened between him and Kimberly. He seemed shocked when they confronted him about these letters and the fact that all of them had been saved, but ultimately he didn't seem to have anything to hide. But Terry, as you can probably expect, was full of crap. He had refused to speak to investigators about Kimberly's disappearance for over 20 years at this point, and he definitely didn't willingly come in like Frank did. So they showed up at his house to talk to him. And as they knocked on his door, he slipped out of the back of his house into the wrecker side of his property. Okay. He jumped in this old beat up car and was opening a gate and like trying to leave as fast as he could. Now, thankfully they were able to intercept him and you can see he very quickly rethought his actions. And it's almost kind of funny on the cold justice episode because he almost acts as if like he was never trying to leave. They're like, you know, we're, we're pretty sure you were just trying to run from this conversation. He was trying to act so casual. He was like, oh, I just didn't see you guys. And they're like, you literally looked us in the face. Like you looked us in the face as you fled from your home to try to get out of here on the other side of your property, hoping we wouldn't catch up to you. Okay. And he continued this kind of casual BS attitude the entire time he was being questioned. He claimed to the authorities that Kimberly had been fine that day when he saw her, that she came over, um, everything was great, she was in a fine mood, but you could tell there was something so off going on with this man. Like they tried to keep things so neutral at first and just be like, what do you think happened? And kind of let him dig his own hole. And he, he definitely did that because on his own, he brought up the fact that she had been dating another man from work and it was almost like he still seemed mad about it. And he also tried to say that after their breakup, that his personal approach was to just give Kimberly space, which totally contradicted what everyone else had said over the last 24 years. And he just continued to lie and lie and deny and deny. He said that he never gave her $500 to go to Mexico and he said he didn't even know that she had been to Mexico at all. He even went against his own original statement and denied that he ever hit her during their relationship. And most alarmingly, he changed the reason why she came over. Instead of his original story that she came over because he needed help putting up boards, he now said that she was the one who reached out to him and said that she left things at his house that she needed to pick up. So it kind of seemed like he had forgotten the lie that he had told because little did he know Kimberly had actually reached out to someone about going to his house and she said that he had called her saying that she had left expensive jewelry and things at his house and in storage that she needed to come and get. She had called one of her close family friends about this and they begged her not to go and she said he hasn't done anything in months. I think I'll be okay. I don't want to miss out on my jewelry like these are important pieces of mine. And this friend even was like, I will buy you every single one of these pieces new. Just please don't go over there. So he at this point seemed to be telling a partial truth, but was trying to say that she was the one that reached out to him, which is definitely a bit of a tactic there. Now, by the end of the cold justice episode, the DA launched a grand jury investigation. They wanted to charge Terry with murder, even though they still didn't have a body. It was clear he had something to hide. It was clear that he he had the most motive out of everyone and he was the last to see her. And obviously they had probably a lot more evidence that they had not shared with the public. But then things took a turn in the most incredible way. That same month that the cold justice episode aired that they were trying to get the grand jury to look into everything an informant actually brought forward huge information.
information to the Beaumont police. Terry himself had apparently told this informant that he did in fact kill Kimberly at his home in 1999 and he buried her on his property. So when this informant was able to bring them all of this information, they just needed a warrant at this point, a warrant to try to find her body. That was like the missing piece that they needed. So by June 10th of this year, Beaumont Police Department were able to get an evidentiary warrant to go and check out Terry's home on Lindbergh Drive. The search began that day and over the course of the next few days, several agencies joined in on the efforts because this was huge. This was groundbreaking. And quite frankly, things like this don't happen in these cold cases very often. So the ATF came in, the FBI, the Public's Work Department, as well as Texas EquiSearch, um, because they brought in ground penetrating radar. They're like, we are going to find where this man buried her and we are going to return her home. Now, police have been working to find what happened to King Langwell, and they believe that there could be evidence to assist in their investigation, not just at this residence on Lindbergh Drive, but even in the nearby property. Police say that they will continue searching the wide area until they find what happened to Kim Langwell. And by June 13th, the radar found an anomaly. In one of the bedrooms of Terry's home, there was a portion under the floor on the concrete slab. It was about three foot by five foot that was missing rebar. And if you're not familiar with what that is, it's kind of like the metal crisscross bracing that goes in concrete to keep it stable. Tim Miller said, quote, we knew it had been cut out. I thought, my God, it's the perfect size for a person to bury someone. City crews were called in right away to carefully remove the concrete and then everyone on scene began digging by hand, realizing how close they were after 25 years, 25 years chasing this man, trying to get enough evidence. The thought that Kimberly had been buried under this man's house this entire time was infuriating, disgusting, devastating, like every possible emotion you can imagine. And by 3 a.m., after careful digging to preserve evidence, they found something. Remains were wrapped in a blanket. The human remains were discovered during the search. The identity of the remains are being confirmed at this time. However, we believe they are the remains of Kimberly Langwell. During a press conference on Friday, BPD Chief Jimmy Singletary thanked the FBI, ATF, and Texas EquiSearch for helping solve Langwell's disappearance. He also highlighted the detectives who have been on the case for decades. By 6.15 p.m. that day, Terry Rose was arrested for the murder of Kimberly Langwell. Not long after that photo there at BPD, officers led Terry Rose in handcuffs down the stairs at the police department headquarters downtown. His ride to the Jefferson County Correctional Facility. KFDM had plenty of questions, but Rose had nothing to say to us tonight, passing up on his opportunity to give his version of events and his side of the story. They held a press conference where everyone that had kept fighting for answers all of this time were finally able to say that they had done it. Nobody had given up and everyone worked together. That was probably what got this case solved. And honestly, I feel like is exactly what we need more of. And we talk about this all the time on this channel. The fact that there needs to be more of a collective effort by numerous different agencies to bring in different resources, different skill sets to try and get these cases solved. And they were able to finally bring Kimberly home. They did something that a lot of people assumed was going to be impossible. It's a long time coming and I'm so very grateful to, to have my mother back. Not in the way that I wanted her, but to know that she's no longer um, being held is, is a good feeling. Tiffany McInnes has waited for answers in her mother's disappearance for 25 years. She was only 15 years old when she reported her 34-year-old mother, Kimberly Langwell, missing on July 9th of 1999. McInnes contacted police after Langwell never showed up for dinner plans they had made that night. I've known that since the day that she was gone. She's been there, so um, it's tough. It's tough to know where your mom is and know that 
There's nothing you can do. She at least could lay her to rest with dignity at this time. She was no longer being held hostage by this monster of a man. That was literally what he had always done, was hold her hostage even in the 25 years after her death. Kimberly was finally back with the people that actually loved her. And while I don't fully understand why they were never able to check this area until this time, you know, if they strongly believed that he did something to her, was there no sign that like things had been cut up? Like, did he have to cut the floor out to get to this area? Was there like a crawl space? I'm just baffled that he was able to pull this crap off for as long as he was. But I'm so thankful that they were finally able to get answers. Tiffany said that she hopes that Terry Rose is going to end up in jail forever. Quote, I hope that he lives at least the 25 years that we've suffered through at the very least. Obviously, everyone in Kimberly's life wants answers. They want to know why. They want to know what happened, what made him do what he did. But Tiffany has said that she does not believe he's anywhere near gracious enough to give them those answers, to give them the truth of what happened. He's the kind of person that wants to stay in control and he's going to hold on to that as long as he can. But more importantly, out of all of this, Tiffany reminded everyone to remember the Kimberly that she knew and loved the loving, fun, and feisty woman that had raised her, that should have been able to live the beautiful life that she had fought hard to have, to see her daughter go to prom and to get married and grow up, maybe marry Ken, a man that seemed to finally treat her the way that she knew she deserved to be treated. That is how she wants her mom to be remembered. Now, obviously, they had assumed these remains were Kimberly's because who else's would they be? But it wasn't until a little over a week ago that they were able to formally announce through DNA that they did in fact belong to Kimberly, but everyone again already really knew that. Now, Terry is currently being held in jail on $1 million bond, and if he somehow manages to make that, which so far is not looking likely, thankfully, he will have to wear an ankle monitor and he's not allowed to leave the county. Now, I am so torn because I personally hope that he pleads guilty and spares everyone from a trial and lets them move forward. But part of me also hopes that he has to sit and listen to what he did and how he affected people and an entire community over the last 20 25 years and that he realizes that he's nowhere near as smart as I'm sure he thinks he is. All I can picture is him laughing and joking in the Cole Justice episode after he lied straight to the faces of the investigators, just yards away from Kimberly's body. He genuinely seemed so pleased with himself that he had been able to pull this off yet again. It's disgusting. Only time will tell and I will keep you guys updated. I haven't seen anything at all about whether he's going to plead guilty or not guilty, what attorney is representing him when they believe his trial is going to begin, if, again, he has a trial, um, because this is all so fresh and so new and I can guarantee you they are working their butts off down there in Beaumont, Texas to make sure this is an ironclad investigation and there's no way that he will be found not guilty if, you know, again, this goes to trial. Now, I want to end this case with what Officer Carol Riley said about it being solved after almost three decades, because I believe it's a great reminder. Quote, this tells people that are sitting out there thinking that they may have gotten away with something that that's not always the way it is. New technology is always around the corner. Sleep with one eye open and know that we are still digging. I hope that you guys leave this video with a renewed sense of wanting to help out these families that maybe don't get as much coverage. These families that, you know, maybe the case has been sitting for 15, 20 years. Cases that aren't going viral all over TikTok or Instagram. These cases that still matter, that still need answers. These families that still need some sort of closure. Again, if you are able, please, as a birthday, a present to me. If you could give whatever donation you are able to the Cold Case Foundation, I would be beyond grateful. On that note, you guys, I'm going to go ahead and go. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to listen to Kimberly Langwell's story. If you haven't already, go ahead and hit the subscribe button down below so you can become a part of the Helen fam so we can hopefully bring them home together or bring them justice together. And I will see you guys in my next video. Bye.